Welcome to the Republican Professor. This morning in California, we have Dr. Philip Vincent Philip Munoz with us. Very special guest indeed. And this is morning in California where I am, but uh, Dr. Munoz is is, is uh, visiting us from. I'm in South. I was just in California, actually, but now I'm back home in South Bend. South Bend. Do people have like a special accent in South Bend? Like, is there a Southern Bend accent or? They just, you know, tend, like a, they just tend to say, go Irish. Frequently. Go Irish. I was going to say, Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. <laughs> but uh, that's uh, that's about all I know about Notre Dame. And I'm a big fan of that film. You know the film, right? Hopefully you know the film. Well, I know that I've actually seen the film from beginning to end. I've I've watched I'm sure I've seen oh, man. various times on, you know, various airplane trips and campus showings, but I, I can't remember sitting down and watching it uh, you know, from start to finish. What? Wow. That is an interesting fact. One of okay, mine. so let's get this on the record. You teach at Notre Dame and you have not seen Rudy all the way through yet it's a real sin, i think it's not a mortal sin yeah <laughs> no <laughs> wow uh are you a football fan oh yeah yeah i go to the games sure wow okay all right well the focus of our conversation today is um is the constitution actually and that's why phil munoz is such a special guest because for those who know the name He's uh, virtually um, synonymous with the First Amendment religion clauses of, of the Constitution because he's done so much uh, great work on it. And um, one of the books that I was exposed to many years ago was called God and the Founders. And how would you not love that name? Yeah, it's got an American flag on it and got the word God on it. And that's a red blooded American book if I've ever seen one. And it's a Cambridge University Press. And uh, it was the first time that I had ever thought about the founders disagreeing about um, what the impact of the First Amendment would be or should be. And so I recommend that book and we'll probably talk a little bit about it. I used it to prepare for this interview because I wanted to make sure he's got a very helpful chapter at the very end, which for those of you who just want to know the answer, what's the answer? You know, um, he applies it to Supreme Court jurisprudence. So you have to know something about these Supreme Court cases. The Supreme Court is weighted into all these all sorts of different issues and that leads me to the comment that I want to make about the other book that I have of his religious liberty and the American Supreme court essential cases and documents. Um, and he's edited this book with helpful intros. This book is Roman and little, uh, little field. Yep. And this is also very helpful as well. Um, because it's got summaries of the essential Supreme Court cases on religious liberty and establishment. So, Phil, you've done quite a bit of work, and now you have another book coming out, and it's coming out this month. We're recording this August 1st, 2022. Um, 2022 years after Jesus, by the way. I thought I would put that in there just because of the name of the topic. But uh, we're recording this, and it's coming out this uh, this month, and it's um, published by University of Chicago Press. Is that correct? Yeah. I'm actually told I'm going to receive my copy. I haven't actually seen it yet, but it's, oh. it, I got an email on Friday from the head of the press that it's a tangible object and it exists in the world. And That's um, awesome. Give me a copy, which I'm supposed to receive this afternoon. So That's uh, so cool. Available now at the University of Chicago Press website uh, webpage, and will be available for us in a few weeks. I'm going to pull it up uh, on Amazon really quick. Um, the paperback. I'll share my screen here. Paperback version. 
So those of you listening on Apple Podcasts and you can't see what I'm saying, uh, this will be posted on YouTube and uh, you can take a look at it or you could just listen carefully and and uh, go to Amazon and check it out or your local. I like to, to uh, suggest going to the local book dealer. Here's the book Religious Liberty and the American Founding, Natural Rights, and the orig Original Meanings of the First Amendment Religion Clauses. Now, there's two clauses. Uh, when you talk about constitutional interpretation, you got to go clause by clause sometimes. Um, so you got the Establishment Clause, and you've got the... The book free covers them both, but... Uh... What the founders uh, meant uh, by an establishment of religion and um, what they meant by the free exercise of religion, at least in so far as we can tell. Part of the argument is that it's not uh, altogether clear what they meant by these uh, phrases and mm -hmm. words. Therefore, I argue that the clauses, clauses have to be constructed, and I yeah. give construction. They have to be constructed, which that's that's pretty normal, right? For for a for a constitutional provision? Well, yeah, I mean, There's nothing I, odd about that. I'm using the term in a bit of a technical way. Um, okay. A distinction, uh, I mean, it's an old distinction, but it's uh, scholars have been working on it a lot recently, say in the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, a difference between interpretation and construction. Um, hmm. Just to simplify. Okay. Interpretation is just um, figuring out what the words mean in an ordinary way. Uh, construction occurs when you can't figure out what the words mean in an ordinary way. So a very simple, again, I'm simplifying and uh, here's an easy example. You know, the, the president must be 35 years old. Right. Um, well, uh, you know, that's pretty obvious what that means. Um, president must be 35. <laughs> um, Af after birth or before birth counting? Well, you know, 35 at the moment. <laughs> him or her or 35 when he or she takes the oath of office i mean you know you can actually come up with some uh, maybe not so obvious answer or obvious even obvious text can have some complications that's what i mean to say. yeah right Here, part I of my head to my argument um uh what is an establishment of religion now an interpreter might say look uh Whatever the founders meant by an establishment of religion, that's what the First Amendment prohibits. You can't make a law respecting an establishment of religion. But what if it's not clear what the original public meaning of the word establishment is? Right, and, right. Well, you know, maybe people disagree. Maybe there are various reasons they might have adopted that phraseology. Um, maybe it was underdetermined even at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of my argument. If the words are under underdetermined or we can't quite figure out what the original meaning of, uh, of those words is, then we have to construct the text. And constructions are um, somewhat creative. You construct the text in light of something. And my argument is that the text, if you really want to follow the founders, you would construct both the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause uh, under the guise of natural rights. Yes, that's interesting natural rights now i i did thank you for the copy that you provided me by the way of the of the book so i did uh read chunks of it i haven't read the whole thing but i have read chunks of it and i did go through the book the way it's written um i didn't i resisted the urge to go to the back of the book and get the answer right where the people want to know what's the answer that the book argues for as far as how the how that view of the original the, the original public meaning the construction the design originalism construction would uh, land on the cases that uh, careful observers are aware of right from our last hundred years or so there's a number of of uh surprises in there for me i was like whoa hold on a second so we'll have to get into some of that um now uh what i like about the book is that you're very careful to say 
let's present this historical picture, this snapshot of when the Constitution was designed and written, the Bill of Rights, how they were thinking about rights in general, right? And the limitations of government power, because that's what we're talking about. Yeah, it, 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 you can, right. it is a historical snapshot, but let me, um, what's interesting, I think, in part about that historical snapshot is there, the founders were making arguments about uh, what is justice, what justice requires. So it's not just uh, a matter of history and, um, you know, our history is important to us and especially in matters of law. Um, but the reasons I'm doing it, uh, doing this project is not just to understand what the founders thought. Uh, the founders said, um, this is what justice requires. Now the founders might have been right, they might have been wrong. Uh, the first task is to understand what they thought, so then we can evaluate it. So it's, um, maybe we're particularly interested in our founders because they're our founders, if you're an American, but really it's, a, um, it's an inquiry into what justice demands. Yeah. Uh, and in any number of places, you could start with contemporary thinkers, you could start um, you know, with Aristotle, you, you could start wherever you want. Um, I think the founders have some insights that are interesting. Mm -hmm. They're the first to talk about inalienable rights, inalienable, right. at least in our constitutional context. And I'm interested in what is an inalienable right? Does that concept make sense? Um, and if it does, what would it look like if we applied it uh, in, in our constitutional law? And yeah. it's, and I don't answer the question on whether we should follow the founders. I say, look, we can't follow the founders or we can't even reject the founders if we don't know what they thought and what they said. Um, so it's a precursor to a larger um, discussion we have to have. Uh, should we adopt the founders' views as soon as we understand them? And I don't think we understand them. So that's why I wrote the book. Uh, that's very clear. So Phil, there's, let's get into some of the issues here. Uh, because I think the way most people get, because people have a limited attention span, as you well know, as a professor. <laughs> um, and I know first person, because when I come to this stuff, I know I have a limited attention span. And it seems like there's all sorts of issues that come up in the contemporary context where we want the Constitution to provide an answer, right? So, for example, just recently, the Supreme Court decided a case, I forget the name of it, it's got the word Kennedy in it, the name of the coach, it's where the, they, what was it? The party is the city of Bremerton, the suburb city. of, the suburb of Seattle, yeah. That's right. Bremerton. The city of Bremerton. I should have known that because I served for a small period of time on the USS Bremerton. I should have known that. But, okay, so the, the Kennedy guy was praying. He was a coach, and he was praying, and it was voluntary for students to be involved or something like that. This went all the way to the Supreme Court. He <laughs> was a coach, I think an assistant coach um, at the Bremerton High School, public school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he would pray after the football games on the 50-yard lines. Yeah. Um, and it, um, the school district told him to stop doing that because the school district uh, feared it would be a constitutional violation. They feared it would be a constitutional violation because some Supreme Court presidents have said uh, state actors and school district and the coach could be considered a state actor. Mm -hmm. State actors can't endorse religion. So the school district was afraid or was saying, look, we have to follow the First Amendment. Um, maybe it's not 100 percent clear if your actions violate the first amendment but because they might we want you to stop doing that uh he said no he thought he had a first amendment right to pray on the 50-yard line so it got all the way to the supreme court supreme court sided with the coach saying that um you know the coach uh, or the school district and allowing the coach to pray um would not violate the constitution and it's a it's a major decision it seems to overturn existing precedents 
um, especially the lemon test and the endorsement test. Um, uh, the court didn't say they overturned those precedents, but they said they recognized that these precedents have been abandoned and uh, they're no longer good law, it, it would seem. So the court didn't, um, didn't exactly use my approach, uh, but they did make a significant uh, change in the law. Yeah. So the lemon test, people may have heard that term before. There's three necessary conditions. Sometimes people call it three prongs. It's establishment clause, right? So, yeah. So the First Amendment says uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So the question is, you know, what's an establishment of religion? Uh, in 1947, the court said um, the establishment clause creates a wall of separation between church and state. Uh, they're quoting uh, Thomas Jefferson here. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was quoting Roger Williams. Um, but, you know, that's not very clear either. What's, what's a wall of separation? And in 1971, I believe, the court in a case called Levin v. Kurtzman said, uh, well, the wall of separation, uh, there's three parts. Um, uh, government cannot, uh, government must have a secular legislative purpose. Government cannot advance or inhibit religion and government cannot excessively entangle itself with religion. And um, uh, those three prongs, as you say, are known as the lemon test. Yeah, and, from the name of the case. Yeah, it has governed a lot of church state jurisprudence, not all of it, but a lot of it for the last 50 years. And yeah. uh, as of June, that test has been abandoned by the Supreme Court. Now, it was kind of, was it, was it applied consistently? Well, it's not so much was it applied consistently. I mean, in some cases, they just ignored it altogether. Yeah. So, uh, without explaining why they uh, why they ignored it. So in a case called uh, Marsh, Marsh v. Chambers, which is yeah. there's a state legislature that has a chaplain. I think it's right. 1983, that they might be wrong. Nebraska uh, has a It was a during Burger. It was during the Burger. They have a chaplain. Now, this is a chaplain who would lead the, le the state legislative session uh, in prayer and provide counseling to the legislators and pay by the state. You know, so right. they fit of the uh, Nebraska state legislature would seem to advance religion. Uh, some would say it would entangle religions. Maybe there is a secular purpose, maybe there's not. But the court, in the, when the case got to the Supreme Court, didn't even apply the limit test. They just pretended it didn't exist. And, and the, odd, the odd thing was is that he was the guy that wrote it. <laughs> Brother, yeah, the, I think, was the guy that wrote it. Uh, Establishment Clause jurisprudence has been a mess. But maybe that's the one thing everyone agrees to. Yes. You know, originalists and non-originalists, conservatives and liberals, yeah. everyone the clause has been a mess. Uh, sometimes it applies its tests, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it makes new tests. If it doesn't like the result the tests would produce, it modifies the test. There's really no rule of law. Right. My argument is that's because, um, I mean, to speak plainly, the justices have been making stuff up. To use a technical term, it's a lot of make-believe. Um, well, why has that happened? And my argument is, well, it's not actually all what... Okay, we're, we're back. Sorry, uh, we, we got interrupted yeah, yeah. technical. I was just talking about the drafting of the establishment clause and i was saying that uh, yeah. a lot of a lot of jurisprudence modern jurisprudence has um constructed the establishment clause which is a fancy way of saying that the justices have made up establishment clause rules whether the wall of separation or something else non-endorsement um, and i think one of the reasons they've made up these doctrines or tests is because what an establishment is is not clear um my yeah is that the framers actually adopted language that was not clear. Um, it was underdetermined. It's not, it's not really clear what they had in mind when they said, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. One of the reasons our establishment clause jurisprudence is so confusing and really haphazard is be, because the language isn't clear. And so we have to interpret this text or construct this text. And the question is, well, how do we do it? Yeah. 
history should we turn to? And I take a, a philosophical view, which is says, well, the underlying purpose of the Constitution is to protect natural rights. Um, it's to do justice. And the founders understood justice in terms of natural rights. Natural rights are just those, those liberties we have on account of our human nature. Right? And so what would a natural rights approach to, to the Establishment Clause and Free Exercise Clause, or to religious liberty more generally? That's what the book explores. So it, it, um, the book, there's three parts of the book. It explains the philosophy of natural rights and the philosophy of religious freedom. That's part one. Uh, the second part explains in, in detail, this is really written for the lawyers, the original meaning, what we can know and not know about the text of the First Amendment. And then the third part um, talks about what a natural rights approach to the Establishment Clause and Free Exercise Clause uh, would look like. And then you have a conclusion that says, so to, considers whether we should adopt that. Yeah, I don't, really what I'm trying to do in most of the book is just present to uncover the founders' uh, political thinking and the history of the First Amendment. I, I'm not trying to say this is what I think should be done. Yeah. The conclusion I offer, it's not even really my own view. I try to say, well, this, these are some advantages and disadvantages of adopting the natural rights approach. Um, and right. I'm trying to help readers, help judges uh, think through things more clearly. Uh, it's not a book that says, you know, this is what Dr. Munoz thinks we should do. I mean, that's, I, I'm not that presumptuous. Um, just trying to uncover what the founders thought, what we can know about what they thought, uh, and how we can apply what we can know about their thought in light of what we don't know and can't know about the Constitution. One of the virtues of the natural rights approach is the natural rights are, is, are supposed to be cons logically consistent, right? They're supposed to not conflict with other natural rights that people have. Yeah. And uh, this goes to the issue of exemptions, right? So that's one of the issues in First Amendment re religion clause jurisprudence. Take, for example, the infamous Scalia or famous, depending on which side you're on, uh, Scalia decision in 1990 in the Smith case, the Employment Division versus Smith um, from Oregon. Um, in jurisprudence is whether the First Amendment provides exemptions from. Yeah. Um... Uh, did I lose you, Phil? <laughs> Oh, are, you, are we back? <laughs> Looks like we had another gap there. So okay. I was just talking about the Smith decision. Did you hear any of what I said about the Smith decision? I think what you said, yeah. Oh, okay. I was just kind of teeing it up for you, which is the infamous uh, Scalia decision or the famous one, depending uh, on which side, uh, where he said that the the American Indians who had ingested uh, a type of drug I think it was a narcotic and a religious ceremony. And everybody agreed it was religious ceremony. It was a religious conduct. They were not eligible for unemployment benefits in Oregon. And that was in 1990. It's called Employment Division versus Smith. Yeah. So that's a religious exemption issue. In the, I mean, Scalia said there was no exemption. but And the court said that. It wasn't just Scalia. But um that set off a bipartisan rifra fire storm that took that went all the way across the country i mean um i think clinton signed it into law and it was really really popular at the federal level and of course the state level there's rifras so how would the natural rights approach of the founders have handled that yeah good that's i mean that's a a, a good question and it's a major issue in the book. Um, I have an answer that I think um, many conservatives uh, won't like, but I think Scalia was not wrong. Um, not quite that he was right, but he wasn't wrong. Uh, founders, the natural rights approach of the founders would not grant a constitutional right to exemptions from uh, burdensome laws that don't target religion. So uh, the case at hand, the Smith case involved um, these two guys from the state of Oregon, they ingested peyote. 
Peyote is a hallucinogenic drug. It uh, was illegal. Ingesting peyote was illegal in the state of Oregon at the time. Uh, and so they violated these drug laws. Uh, the two gentlemen said that they were ingesting peyote as part of a religious ceremony. That's true. And therefore, because the free exercise clause protects the free exercise of religion, um, the religious use of peyote, uh, they had a right to do so. Right. There's a law that doesn't target religion. The law said nothing about religion. It just says no one can use peyote. Um, right. Peyote is harmful. So does the free exercise clause give religious believers an exemption to this drug law? That's what we mean by an exemption. Um, right. The court, Supreme Court said no. And I think from a natural rights approach, that is correct. Um, the natural rights approach of the founders is much more limited. Um, when the founder says you had the right to religious free exercise, what they meant is that the, to simplify a little bit, is that government can't target your religious exercises. Government could not say the sacramental use of peyote is illegal. Government couldn't say, you know, the practice of Catholicism or the practice of this particular religion is illegal. Um, but they, they didn't mean we're going to pass a general law and if it applies, if religious uh, believers don't like how it applies or affects them, then they get an exemption. That's just not what it meant. Okay. Um... So it's it's kind of maybe it's similar to a minor in a Catholic church. Well, I probably shouldn't talk about the Catholic church because I'm not Catholic. I Okay, we have wine, and it's real wine in um, the Anglican tradition. And um, now what we do is we don't offer it to the minors. We don't offer it to the kids. We have grape juice instead. But what if uh, one day we ran out of grape juice and we only had wine? Um, of course, that is a generally applicable law against the consumption of alcohol in whatever quantity, as far as I can tell. Would that be a similar case? Yeah. I mean, and the Catholic Church uses real wine. Some would say it's not very good wine, but it's it's real no. wine. Uh, so, you know, and um, uh, do certainly, the kids, do the kids consume it? Uh, not right now because things have changed. At least in my parish uh, since COVID. But yeah, sure. In prior they to do? COVID. okay. Is there an exemption in the law for that? Uh, I don't know. It would probably be a matter of state law. Okay. I, mean, I just, I just don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just curious. So these are some of the issues that come up is, you know, let's go back to the 18. For example, okay. just founding era, uh, it's a good example to use. Um, uh, Quakers who don't serve in the military. Right. That's well, an exemption. Uh, so the Quakers um, are pacifists. Um, mm -hmm. That's right. So, um, during the Revolutionary War, if Quakers were drafted. Did the Quakers have a right not to fight? Mm -hmm. That's a big issue. Yeah. Most people, most of my students, you know, they don't want to make the Quakers fight. I don't really <laughs> want to make them fight. Mm -hmm. But the question is, do they have a right not to fight? Yes, I see. I see what you're saying. Not, and the question is not, do we as a people give an exemption to the Quakers? Right. We can give an exemption to the Quakers. We can give an exemption to older people. We can give an exemption to all women. We can say, look, the, we're only going to draft, you know, healthy men between the ages of 18 to 35 who are not Quakers. We could do that. Uh, the question is, do the Quakers, as a, as a matter of justice, have a right to not fight because of their religious beliefs? And the founders... In, enforceable in court. Enforceable in court. Yeah. We do the Quakers uh, a matter of injustice. Would it be unjust to make the Quaker fight? And the answer is, uh, the founder's answer is no, uh, because to be a member of the political community, um, I mean, the very first thing the political community is, is a mutual defense back, right? I'll fight for you, you fight for me, we'll respect another's, one another's rights and we'll fight against our enemies. That's what the political community is. Now you don't have to be a member of the political community 
But if you are a member of the political community, well, then you have the obligations of citizenship, which are to follow the law and when called upon to fight for the community. You can exit the community and renounce your citizenship, but if you're going to be a member on equal terms with everyone else, you've, you've got to fight. Now, there are certain things that the political community can't do. The political community can't tell you how to pray. It can't say you must worship on Saturday or you must worship on Sunday. You must, because that's not part of our political community, right? Our religious exercises, we don't give authority to the government to tell us how to pray or right. how not. But we do give authority to the government to protect us by raising an army, right? That's part of the sphere of the political authority. And uh, having a draft to raise troops to protect us, especially in times of war, is certainly uh, a reasonable means to carry out those legitimate ends. Uh, and it's reasonable that all members of the political community uh, accept their obligations of citizenship and fight. There was a there was a, a case before Smith that Smith overturned, also involving unemployment. Uh, I think it was 30 years before. And there was a lady that was a Seventh-day Adventist. I think it was in South Carolina. Yeah, and she, she was assigned to work on Saturday, which is her Sabbath. She said she can't do that. She lost her job, applied for unemployment benefits, and she was denied. And then this, so this went to court, right? The court said that, uh, no, you got to give her unemployment benefits because that violates her free exercise. Otherwise, how would the approach that you're uh, clarifying for us, uh, handle that? Yeah. In the same way that, you know, as long as the law didn't target her and said, you know, everyone but seventh day of Venice can get unemployment insurance. You can't target seventh day of Venice or any religion, but you, um, if you say, look, people who do not work don't get unemployment compensation, then people who do not work don't get unemployment compensation. You know, as long as the uh, law doesn't target religious exercises, there's no exemption for it. Now, you could make a, the state of South Carolina could pass an exemption, that would be okay for religious uh, leavers, uh, but it's not a matter of constitutional right. So she doesn't have an affirmative right to uh, to the benefits that she paid into um, because even though um, had she said Sunday she would have been on safe ground and she would get those unemployment benefits. Well, I think uh... because that's a majority that said Sunday is when the post office is closed. and Yes, I'm not sure. I I'm not sure about that. Um, she probably wouldn't have been fired from her job if she had worked on Sunday. But the claim was against the state. That's, that's true. Yeah. You have to know more about the state law. I just can't. You wouldn't be unemployed. No, that's that's a good point. Let's go back to the 1800s and the fir one of the first religion clause cases, the major ones anyway. And I, I owe uh, Donald Drakeman uh some street cred for this uh, getting me into this case the reynolds case and um so that involved uh marriage the issue of marriage kind of the definition of marriage actually um there was a mormon sorry that... i lost you again i'm not sure if you can hear me okay i can i could hear that okay we're back <laughs> so um there was, in the Reynolds case, there was there was an issue of bigamy, and there was a guy in Utah, Reynolds, who was convicted of the crime of bigamy, and it was actually quite a harsh punishment. Um, I think it involved hard labor and a, a steep fine. Five hundred dollars fine and two years of hard labor. <laughs> so, and 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 for for what ex, what he claimed was a religious uh, ceremony basically it was a religious uh, dispute about that he was a mormon a yeah. mormon is a it's bigamy and polygamy it's clearly a religion uh he, he said if i don't do it i'll go to hell <laughs> that's exactly what he said but he, it, he was asked uh, my understanding is he was asked by his uh uh 
religious superiors to take a second wife. Um, plural ma marriages were practiced by the Mormon church at the time. They're not anymore, but they were at the time. So it, it's, there's no dispute that this is a religious exercise, same as the Quakers' pacifism is a religiously motivated exercise, same as the uh, guys who ingested peyote in Oregon in 1990. These are religiously motivated actions. Um, uh, the question of before the court is the same in each case, right? Uh, the law in the Reynolds case didn't target Mormons. It didn't say anything about Mormons. Um, it just says you can't get married to more than one person. Right? You can only marry one person. Bigamy is illegal. Uh, in the court in uh, 1879, agreed with that. No, uh, no constitutional right for bigamous uh, marriages, even if they are religiously motivated. So does that, but but doesn't that have the effect of punishing the religious conduct by upholding the criminal conviction? I'm afraid. Or, oh, are you back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have an unstable stable connection today. I apologize to the audience, but um, what my question was is that was a criminal case, and it's a little different than these other administrative cases like unemployment and stuff like that. Those are just admin stuff. But now you're talking about the criminal law. You're talking about criminalizing something that's uh, considered religious. Well, actually, peyote would be. But that wasn't a criminal case. That was administrative. So does it change with the criminal law applied? From a philosophical point of view or a natural rights point of view, I don't think that makes any difference whatsoever. Um, so we're, we're talking about um, uh, not what the court has said, but uh, my understanding of the founders approach here doesn't matter, matter if it's criminal or civil. Um, all right. So we got some good stuff here. People are going to give me a right hate mail if I don't get to the Shemp case at some point. <laughs> so we got the Bible reading cases and the Ingle versus Fatali uh, case. Those are two famous cases in the 60s. Prayer and Bible reading in school. Um, I thought I would give you a shot at that. Those two cases. Yeah. These are great cases. So uh, it used to be common, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, that you'd have Bible reading and a prayer in a public school. There was a case from New York. Um, uh, I can't remember which one is which, but that's the Regents Prayer case. I think this is Vitaly. That was uh, Engel versus Vitaly, yeah. And the Regents, the, the public officials in charge of the New York public schools, uh, composed a prayer that was recited at the beginning of the public school day. Very simple, I think a one sentence or two sentence prayer, you know, something like, you know, mighty creator, we, you know, thank thee for thy blessings or something like that. It's, it's yeah. uh, innocuous for the most part. Uh, and the question before the court is, can you mandate a prayer in public school? Um, the court said no. And I think the natural rights approach would actually agree with that but for different reasons. Uh, the natural rights approach uh, says uh, your religious exercises, prayer being a religious exercise, um, we don't give authority over our religious exercises to the government. What does that mean? It means uh, the government cannot criminalize religious exercises as such. The as such is important, right? You can make general criminal prohibitions. You can prohibit murder. And you can't murder for religious reasons. You can prohibit drug use. You can't use drugs for religious reasons. But you can't criminalize religious exercises. You can't criminalize you, if you pray in this way or to this God. Blasphemy can't be a criminal offense. That's what I mean by as such. For the same reasons that you, the state can't criminalize religious exercises, the state has no authority to prescribe. I mean, to... to um, request or encourage people to participate in religious exercises. Writing a prayer for school children or for anyone, um, that is the government writing the prayer and setting up a situation in the public schools where the kids recite the prayer, um, 
may not be terrible that government does it, but government has no authority to do that. Right? We did not give up government authority to write prayers for us or to write prayers for our school children. At least that's what the founders thought. And therefore, my understanding of the founders' understanding is that the, the founders' natural rights approach would not allow the government to write prayers uh, for recitation at the beginning of the public school event. Okay. That makes sense. I, I can see the method at work there. Um, sometimes I was, I was going to ask your permission to pull up the chart that you sent me. Uh, well, they're part of your manuscript and it might be helpful for people to take a look at um, how your, how your argument um, compares with some of the votes of some of the Supreme court decisions uh, justices recently. Um, I was surprised at some of it, uh, that sometimes, uh, Ginsburg got it right. <laughs> and sometimes, uh, Scalia got it wrong. Yeah. I should say these are on the outcomes of the cases too, you know, not, not, yeah. the re not the reasoning. I mean, right, right. The outcome Justice has adopted the reasoning of natural rights. Uh, part of the book is, uh, or the reason for the book is to explain the natural rights reasoning. Right. That's right. I wanted, I wanted to also read just a part of, I think it was the last paragraph. And I wanted to, you know, I thought that would set you up for some interesting commentary here. Um, sure. The last paragraph of the uh, second to the last chapter, I'm looking for it really quick here. Got two computers going on here. Um, yeah, I've got it now. Um, so I'm going to, with your permission, I'll, I'll display this, what I'm looking at here, and um, share my screen here. Okay, so this is the last paragraph of Chapter 8. Um, what these comparisons do not reveal, the comparisons that we're going to take a look at, is why the natural rights approach produces such distinctive results. As I will discuss in the concluding chapter, the approach demands a sort of judicial inquiry that is different from any existing approach. It produces neither liberal nor conservative results in the contemporary political sense because it does not focus on mandating a particular relationship between church and state, such as neutrality or producing particular outcomes such as separation, accommodation, non-entanglement, or non-interference. Rather, the approach focuses on the jurisdictional limits of state power, a consideration that is all but ignored by existing approaches to church-state jurisprudence, but central to the founders' understanding of religious liberty. Yeah, yeah it's funny. It's funny to have someone else read your work. I'm, yeah. I'm listening and I'm like, oh, I think, yeah, that's good. I think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's That sounds like how you would say it, right? <laughs> well, the founders were um, concerned with jurisdiction. What, what do I mean by that? Right. That, um, when the founders thought about religious liberty, they, they said religious liberty is an inalienable natural right mm -hmm. or an unalienable. That's the word they used, unalienable. We say, yeah, inalienable. yeah, yeah. An unalienable natural right is a right that you don't give authority to the government, but you don't give authority over to the government. So why can't government prescribe, we could use a different example. Um, uh, if you want to be a lawyer, you have to get a law license. If you want to get married, you have to get a marriage license. I don't think you have to get a podcast license, at least not. <laughs> and you will. It, you know. If, if, yeah, if, if that was the case, I would be a criminal right now. But um, what about a, a preaching license? Yeah. You have to get a license to preach. And the founders would say no. No, you don't have to get a license to preach. Why not? Because government doesn't have authority to issue preaching licenses. Right. 
why doesn't government have authority to issue preaching licenses? And the answer is because we never gave government authority over our religious exercises. That's an inalienable or non-alienated natural right. We don't alienate. That is, we don't give government power to tell us how to worship. Mm. That means government can't write prayers for school children. Mm -hmm. Government can't punish us for saying the prayers we say or saying the wrong prayers. That's why blasphemy can't be made illegal. I mean, there might be something that is blasphemous. I'm not saying that there's no blasphemy. Um, it's not the business of the state to enforce what is or what is not blasphemy. It's not the business of the state because we, the people, have never given the state that authority. And the founder's argument is we can't give the government that authority because our religious obligations uh, we owe to the creator. Uh, because we have obligations to the creator we re and we retain authority and responsibility for those obligations, we don't give authority over those obligations to the government. So there's so, a re there's a religious reason why we never gave that authority. That's right, right? It's saying whatever our obligations to God are, to the creator are, they are of higher authority than any obligations we create to other men. Mm -hmm. right? So there's an, an, uh, a philosophical understanding um, yeah. the whole right that uh, one's obligations to one's fellow citizens which are created through the through the institution of government must always leave space for one's prior obligations to the creator that's the case for limited government that's yes. the case for inalienable rights and what i'm trying to say is if we take this seriously what does that how does that translate into jurisprudence and it translates in ways, as you suggested, that are maybe somewhat surprising, right? It do, you mind if I, do you mind if I share my screen again on, on one of the charts that you gave me? If these are the uncorrected proofs. Um, that, I'm, I'm actually told today, I think I mentioned this earlier, I'll get a copy of the book. So um, Awesome. Well, let's share this. This is a table eight, and there's a table seven I'll, I'll share in a minute adjudication of establishment and so you've provided a table here of how the natural rights construction would land compared to scalia thomas kennedy o'connor Breyer, ginsburg brennan um just to give an, a, a smattering and you're trying to show i think that the natural rights construction doesn't fall into exactly the the lines that we might expect so you can't be accused of you know this 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 view can't be accused of merely being republican or democrat so mm -hmm. you have for example state chaplains in marsh and marsh versus chambers scalia allowed it or would have allowed it Th thomas would have allowed it even though that the case predates their tenure, but he, you have a little asterisk there that explains why you say that. Uh, you don't have a, a view about Kennedy, but Connor allowed it. O'Connor allowed it. But Ginsburg and Brennan pr would have prohibited that. But the natural rights agrees with Ginsburg and Brennan on that. Um, so no legislative chaplains for the state of Nebraska, I guess it was, or any state. Is that right? Does that sound right? Yeah, I think that's right because. Um, what about in the military? What for? What about military chaplains? Yeah, you know what James Madison said about the military was, um, uh, even for Navy crewmen at sea, um, the government can't hire chaplains and pay chaplains. Uh, it's not the business of government to help us uh, do our religious worship. Now, could could i'm catholic so let me just use catholic church could the catholic church provide a chaplain right for the lawyer sure yeah but the the government i'm sorry the church providing a chaplain uh, so navy uh service members can yeah. is different from the government employing a chaplain hiring a chaplain to do religious worship which is which is the current setup because the the chaplain yeah. is an officer of the, of the military. Uh, 
most of my family would say, you know, come on, it's not a big deal. Maybe it's not a big deal. Not everything has to be a big deal to be unconstitutional, right? right. What, what we do is rigorously uh, show what the consequences of these principles are. Some consequences may be minor, we don't really care, but these are the consequences of the principle. Mm -hmm. Okay, on, on the um, state aid to religious schools, you have a Lemon at, versus Kurtzman and Zellman Harris. Um, the natural construct rights construction would allow that, and that's in line with Scalia, Thomas, Kennedy, O'Connor. Um, Breyer has a mixed opinion on that, and then Ginsburg and Brennan would say prohibited. So it disagrees with the Democrats on that one and agrees with the Republicans. Yeah, I, on, on that um, on that issue, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, it changes depending on the issue. Depending on the issue. Um, uh, and I do that to just, just to show that um, no one has really... Um, understood and therefore applied the natural rights approach. Again, whether or not we should apply the natural rights approach is a, is a different question than um, what results with the natural rights approach dictate. Yes, um, right. This is, this is the philosophy. Uh, this is why it makes constitutional sense. This is what it would lead to. And then I leave it up to people on their own. You can right. judge whether you, you like it or not. Um, it's not my approach. It's the founders' approach. You know, I, I, you know, some, I don't... some some people are ex like the movie Elf are extremely excited about Christmas. So yeah. we got to get to the Christmas displays here, the state-supported religious displays in uh, County of Allegheny and you know, the American Legion. I think that there was some other ones, Mercury County, maybe. No, that was Ten Commandments, right? Is that Ten Commandments? There was a crush case. I forget what the crush case was. Um, the famous one in the 80s. Yeah, Lynch v. Donnelly, and I think Allegheny. Lynch versus Donnelly. There you go. Okay, so the natural light rights construction would allow. You see the 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 crush, I think it was Lynch versus Donnelly. Anyway, there was a there was a big Christmas tree, and then there was a a, a smaller um menorah kind of candelabra or something like that and that was okay because they were together and then there was a crash somewhere else on the property uh, it was a government property and the crash is a nativity scene and that was just by itself and that was unconstitutional but the christmas tree was okay so, yeah, so was the court using justice o'connor's endorsement test yes rule yeah. there you know, the state can't endorse religion right and right right I, mean, I think people are a little bit harsh uh, on the test, um, though I'm not a fan of it myself. But <laughs> the idea was, well, you could have a uh, you know a Christian nativity scene as long as you threw in a frosty and a, you know a couple of reindeer, because then it wouldn't be an endorsement of religion; it'd just be a celebration of the season. Mm. Uh, you know, rightfully, well, that's silly. You know, I mean, uh, either you can or you can't do these things. Um, I, I think a helpful way to look at it is this. Um, uh, let's say you're in favor of a colorblind constitution. Okay. I'm not saying I am, I'm not saying you are. Just imagine. You, people, most people will know what a colorblind constitution is. Could you say that again? Looks like we have a technical uh, judge issue. people according to their race in college admissions doesn't mean Black History Month when in college or in fifth grade or whatever, whatever school it is. Um, to say that the state has no authority over religious exercises doesn't mean the state can't recognize by putting a display up in the town square. You know, same reason. Um, City of Los Angeles might recognize um, Jackie Robinson or any other heroes from the city's history uh, because they're the heroes of the people. The city can recognize, you know, religious traditions of various religious citizens of the city. I just don't think these are very hard cases, to be honest. Hmm. 
Yeah, so in the state displays, um, the natural rights construction would allow it in line with the most of the Republicans. O'Connor uh, is a little bit more complicated. Breyer is a little bit more complicated. Um, uh, so there's a couple of mixed bags in the middle, Breyer and O'Connor. Ginsburg and Brennan would prohibit that. Um, now, it on just prima facie, it's a little odd <laughs> to, to to it's not a, an odd thing about your view or, or the book or anything like that. It's just prima facie. It, it strikes one as odd to say that the Navy is prohibited from having chaplains. And, and by extension, I would imagine all sorts of other things that I, for example, experienced in Navy boot camp, which is I was given a New Testament and, and I would, and there were, um, there was a chapel on base that I could go to as a government building that was used for religious purposes on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, Christmas trees and nativity scenes are fine on government property. Just, I'm just saying prima facie, that sounds a little odd <laughs> to me. So we're not rigorous in thinking, you know, what is it exactly that we withhold from the government? Again, it's a jurisdictional approach. Yeah. We give the government some power. We, we don't give the government other powers. What exactly do we give and do we not give in terms of uh, authority vis-a-vis -vis religion? And we don't give government power over our religious exercises. That means you can't hire someone to do religious exercises. Okay? Not that religious exercises aren't important. Government has no authority to decide who is and who is not a legitimate chaplain and therefore hire accordingly. Because hmm. you're not going to hire a chaplain for everyone. You're only going to right. hire. Right. Right. It, what, is, what about the Wiccan chaplains? Actually, I think those exist now, but they didn't, they didn't at the founding. That's for not, sure. Not the business of government. Uh, I mean, this is not to say it's not important. It's very important. In fact, the reason why it's not the business of government is because it's so important, but it's not the business of government to uh, direct our religious exercises. An implication of that is, uh, no chaplains. Uh, can you set aside a room for worship um, on a, on you know at the Air Force Academy or whatever? Well, you know that's a little bit more complicated. If you had a uh, could the, could the government build a chapel itself, the exclusive purpose of which is worship? Uh, that might be a tough call. I have to think about that a little bit more. I think the answer is probably no. For the same reason, like, because again, worship is not the purpose of government. It's not within the jurisdiction of the state. If worship is not the purpose of the state, building a house of worship would seem not to be the purpose of government. Another way to think about it is you can regulate, it's legitimate for a government to have building regulations. Is it legitimate for a government to have religious worship building regulations, meaning you know, you must put your altar there. You must put the tabernacle here. No, we'd say government has no, I mean, you can have building regulations, right? Building must be structurally sound. It must have so many parking spaces. Can't be, you know, must have sidewalks, things like that. But we would never say government has authority on where to place a tabernacle or, or you know, how you bless the holy water. It's not the business of government to do that. Right. Uh, I think you can make an argument. Therefore, it's not the business of government to build houses of worship. We want, I would want, you know, members of the Air Force Academy to be able to worship. Right. That's probably why churches should build, uh, uh, fund chaplains for the military. And the churches should build houses of worship next to the military academies. It's not the business of government to do that. At least that was the founders' understanding. Sorry, I think I've lost you. Your voice. 
sorry i was on that was me that was me being uh letting you have all of it i, I put it on mute uh that that does make sense I, because there is a there is a sense of violation that that at least i feel when i might go to the air force academy and see the beautiful chapel is beautiful and it's an amazing building and and there are some awesome buildings uh some of the more crappier chapels that i've ever been on the ones that have the creaky floors but i there, there's something vintage and classic i love about them but when those buildings are now used for wiccans for example i feel a sense of uh horror that something is profaned there but it's a government building <laughs> to kind of your point it's like well what else is going to happen there i mean of course it's a government building they can do what they want um yeah. conservatives and, all the time have thought um the idea that religion is private is bad and and there's a reason for that that they're frustrated by that um but the private sphere is not subservient to the to the state or governmental sphere right um uh sometimes we keep things private because they're more important than the governmental sphere and the government has no business being in the private sphere right so there's a strict separation of the private and the public actually yeah i wouldn't use that term strict separation that's a loaded term and it means sort <laughs> of the founders yeah. by that so i i wouldn't be quick to jump there but there's a distinction between look we the people give government some authority and we don't give it other authority. Right. We don't give it authority over our religious exercises. That means that authority is retained by us and that our religious exercises are private. Therefore, government can't criminalize them, you know, religious exercises, and government can't prescribe them. There's another issue on this chart, uh, hiring and firing of, of teachers and ministers. Hosanna Tabor is an example you give there. And it looks like uh, the natural rights construction is in line with all of them. Looks like uh, Scalia through, well, we don't know Brennan, but um, so there's uh, there's a massive agreement on that, on that one. And let, the issue there on hiring and firing wasn't the issue there was for Hosanna Tabor, the, the teacher was not a religious instructor. Yeah, I, I mean that was and and was an issue. okay. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about hiring and firing, and you're talking about the government regulation of employment, right? Basically. Well, here I'm talking about the uh, regulation of who is and who is not a minister. Um, right. So, um, I think we could say government can regulate employment. Um, government can't tell churches whom to appoint as a minister or not. Okay. I mean, a so class in other words, if if she was, I think it was a female in this example. If she, um, was, uh, in a relationship, a sexual relationship with another woman, and that offended the sensibilities, or was not in line with the sensibilities of the school, that would be an employment issue, right? That would be a discrimination issue. Well, I, yeah, that's not, those aren't the facts of the case in Hosanna Tyler. Um, you could say, I put it this way, um, government has no authority to tell a religion um, who it appoints or the criteria it uses for who is or who is not a minister, right? I mean, the, let's start with simple things. Um, can, can the government tell um, the Catholic Church who to appoint as the bishop of uh san francisco and the argument is right. no right yeah to san francisco since you're, you know the golden gate bridge is behind you right it's up to the catholic church who is the uh, bishop of san francisco the government has no authority to decide who is or who is not a bishop i mean that is a classic establishment it's the government literally the government governing authorities uh, appointing bishops happens in china right now um that's not an authority government has. So what I'm saying here in that chart is government can't appoint who is or who is not a minister. Um, but can it can it direct 
can it direct a church to uh, not discriminate in leadership position if the church runs the school? If 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 there are general laws, non discrimination laws, those certainly only apply to churches. As employers, okay. All right. So you got adjudication of free exercise cases here, and we have the exemptions which we've talked about with the Sherbert and Smith. Sherbert was that uh, unemployment case from South Carolina that we talked about, and then Smith was the um, the American Indians ingesting, I think it was a narcotic, and then they got denied for unemployment. So you say the natural rights construction would not require the the outcome, but would allow it. And that seems like that's basically what Scalia was saying. Sorry, I'm another. What, what case is that? Uh, I'm just on the exemptions on under Sherbert and Smith. Yeah, that's what we were talking about before. The exemptions. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was mentioning. Yeah, natural rights approach um, doesn't mandate exemptions. Now you could have legislative exemptions. The uh, the legislature can gotcha. say well, the Quakers don't have to fight, but it's not a matter of constitutional right. The constitution right. Can give the Quakers a right. That has to be a legislative right. So I think it's important to read the the table here. You got to be careful here because Sherbert and Smith are are actually on opposite sides on that. And so the in terms of exemptions, they're not required. Uh, Thomas would say they are required. Um, Kennedy O'Connor would say they are required. Breyer required. Uh, Ginsburg not required. So. So that's interesting. Okay, so then you have the targeting of religious exercises. You've got the state prayers, which we've already talked about, religious things, uh, exercise on state property, good news club. Can I ask you, there's a couple of other uh, cases, for example, in prison, the Beard uh, case with the um, the Muslims. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there's a there's a case of and I know these cases just from listening to the stream of conscience podcast. Give them a shout out over there. <laughs> um, the uh, the Beckett people. Um, the the uh, take, for example, bringing the knife in the ceremonial knife into the IRS building, the I think it's called a carpon. Um, it's a, it's a part of the Sikh, I believe, uh, religious practice. So what about those cases? Yeah. I mean, the natural rights approach would say, um, if you have a general law that says, you know, prisoners must have a neatly trimmed beard, then that would, that would not violate the constitution. Or if you have a general law that says you cannot bring weapons in a courtroom and the ceremonial dagger is viewed as a weapon then you couldn't bring it in. I mean, the Constitution, we forget, we tend to think, we, many people want the Constitution to allow all the things that they think are as good, is good and prohibit everything they think is bad. But that's not how a Constitution works. Uh, the First Amendment um, takes a few things out of the authority of the government which is really just say out of the authority of the majority through our you know, representation and legislative and executive and judicial system. There are a few things we can't do. We can't make certain religious worship uh, practices illegal. We can't mandate people worship. Most things, whether we do them or not, whether we have a regulation that beards must be of, you know, certain length or certain, um, must be trimmed, neatly trimmed, those are up for democratic majorities to decide. We decide that through representation, uh, or through our representatives, and then through the executive branch, through the governor we um, elect, and you know the wardens he appoints. Uh, most things are our government is republican, meaning it's a government of the people. Right? It's supposed to be a government of the people. So things like that, these minutia questions, are not really constitutional questions. If we don't like it, then we should pass new laws. But the answer is not, well, I don't like this law, therefore it must be unconstitutional. 
That's just not the way constitutions are, at least our constitution was designed to function. Would you say a virtue of this approach is that it clarifies maybe more consistently what a political question would be versus a legal question? Well, yes, but that's not saying much because the court's jurisprudence <laughs> is so muddy and so unclear. It's, it's hard to be less clear than the court. Right? It, so I think that right there, Phil, right, that right there is going to blow a lot of people away that that have a reverence for the court. I mean, obviously, if you think about it for two seconds, you know that the court could get it wrong, could possibly get it wrong and has. But to to hear you say what you're saying, that the Supreme Court has totally screwed this up. <laughs> and I've been I've been prepped for this because I had Michael Yulman as my professor. <laughs> so. So um, I was exposed to this material uh, a while ago and had to read all these cases and, and um, talk about them at length with uh, Michael Yulman. And he said very similar things to what you're saying is that the, the court has screwed this up. And what I loved about Yulman's approach was that when he said it, it was kind of a little bit jarring. Uh, it's a little disorienting to think that such a revered institution could screw something up so important. But at the same time, it, it's like, well, what else would you expect? Because they're just people. They're just people. And they're trying to do the best they can. And um, I guess that's kind of why you're doing what you're doing is we we all need to just help. We ha we need help thinking through these issues. Yeah, I mean, look, I I spent um, you know thirty years uh, thinking about um, part of one amendment. Yeah. Um, and there's uh, several other provisions of the First Amendment. That's right. These are for the most part generalists, as they have to be. All right. Um, I have tremendous respect for the justices. I I think. I admire them all as individuals. Did you uh, serve with Amy Comey Barrett uh, before she was a judge? I teach at Notre Dame Law School, so I, I knew no uh, Justice Barrett. But um, so they, they might have some specialties. You know, Amy is a, a, quite an accomplished scholar, so she has some specialties. But, you know, um, they rely on their clerks, and their clerks rely on the arguments made by the parties before them. Um, what I'm trying to do is, and I should say, and the parties before them typically operate within court precedents, right? If you're a practicing lawyer, you operate your, your, your court, your field of play, as it were, is the, what the court has said. Um, that's not my field of play, right? Uh, I try to take the founder's philosophy seriously and think through it and then show what that is. You know what that results in yeah what a lawyer typically does right that's not the uh it's not what a law professor typically does even um i'm more interested in questions of natural rights and natural justice and that's what i'm trying i'm trying to uh, explore those questions by thinking through the founders answers to these questions it's a very practical way to go about that philosophical task and this, you know, you mentioned Michael Yeoman. This would be a good place to to close. I mean, he was a uh, Dr. Yeoman passed away a few years ago. I, you know, he's he is. Uh, I'm sure, I met him. Most of your listeners don't know who he was. Uh, he was a teacher first and foremost, but he was a Washington insider. Worked in the Ford and Reagan administration. Um, uh, helped Clarence. Clarence Thomas would not be on the Supreme Court without him. Uh, I was just with Bill Barr a few days ago, and Bill Barr writes about Michael Yeoman in his recent uh, autobiography. Uh, but what, what Yeoman really was, was a teacher. And what he had, he had a PhD, had a JD, and he worked in government. And what he tried to show is um, how our governing practices could be informed by deeper philosophical principles. Um, I don't know if he'd, he'd agree with much of what's in this book. I think he would agree with a lot of it, but you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but the spirit of the approach, taking philosophical principles, yes, that's right, into the law. I think yes. very well what I learned from him, 
Um, I know he's both of our teachers and uh, oh boy, it, um, you know, the book, as I said, I'm going to get, um, get a copy this afternoon. It's, I'm supposed to get one delivered to me. And it pains me that uh, I can't give, give a copy to Dr. Yolman. He was a, a dear, dear friend and mentor. I mentor. saw that in your acknowledgments and I was really very touched. Um, I, uh, I was also very touched. I mean, he's in some of your previous acknowledgments as well. And I was very touched by that. Uh, sorry to hear about your parents passing away as well um, on that, 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 you know, um, one of the things that I heard from Yulman the first time was the, the question of whether these uh, first amendment provisions in the religion clauses can be incorporated against the States. Um, and that was his approach. He was very Socratic. Um, he would take an issue that you might think the answer is pretty clear and he would come back to it in a fresh way. And, and it was almost like, well, why didn't I think of that? And he would say, take a look at the text of the first amendment. Congress shall make no law. It doesn't say, you know, wall of separ the Danbury Baptist language yeah. that the Donald Drakeman did such a great job of uh, giving us the backstory of, of, you know, the Everson case and all that, the, the, the language of the wall of separation, mm -hmm. how that came to be such a part of our lore. If you go back to the text of the constitution, no law, no Congress shall make no law. And you make an issue of this in your book. And it, it doesn't seem to be readily applicable to the States by the 14th amendment. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think that's right. I talk, I talk about this in the book. It's not it's not clear that you can incorporate the original meaning, at least of the establishment clause. Yeah, right. Here the, the, the real uh, key word is respecting. Con uh, you know, Congress shall make the law respecting the establishment. I think there's a good case to be made that the original meaning of that uh, phrase, whatever the establishment was, is to say the national government, whatever re religious establishments are, they're not the business of the national government that they're the business of the state governments i mean there's lots of evidence to show that um so uh, incorporation means applying the um and the provisions of the bill of rights of the first eight amendments to, against the states uh, and that just doesn't seem to work for the establishment clause um there's actually another issue that you point to when congress shall make no law you could say well if the first amendment is against Congress and its lawmaking ability, it's not clear that the executive branch by applying laws can violate the First Amendment. Mm. Yeah, this is a little inside baseball, but that would suggest yeah. that as applied challenges are, are not um, really part of the constitutional framework. That's where we get into exemptions. Yeah. Right? If, if the First Amendment only prohibits certain types of laws from being legislated, from being made. You can't say the application of a law it, to a particular person is unconstitutional. Only the law can be unconstitutional. You can't say, look, you can have a draft. Is, is that a legitimate power of government? If you say yes, you can't say the draft as applied to the Quakers is unconstitutional. It's because the prohibition is against Congress. Congress shall make no law. It's not the executive shall not apply this law against religious people. So the very structure of the First Amendment means it can't mean exemptions. The, the language of the First Amendment also doesn't contemplate the judge, though. Uh, Article 3, the power of, and duty of judging. Would that have the same result? Like... Uh, well, no, I'm not judge, judges apply the law, right? Uh, yes. So it would, I mean, but, but so a judicial decision wouldn't be unconstitutional. Well, I mean, yeah, that's a, right. Right. I mean, judges are supposed to apply the law in certain circumstances. So the question for the judges, is this law that was made unconstitutional? Yes. Part of the judicial power is to say yes or no. Right. Right. But what I'm saying is it can't be is this law as applied to this individual, individual A, but not individual B, is it unconstitutional? 
the wording of the First Amendment would not give a judge that sort of power if you strictly followed it. It's called an as-applied challenge. Yeah. Okay. Well, for the lawyers. Yeah. 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 So, the, the I think the main takeaway of the book for me anyway is a immersion into the world of the founders and taking that seriously and being prepared that the answer you get may not be the one you expected and to just be open to that and think about it and think about how that should apply or does apply to us. Yeah, that's right. Really, it, uh, it's a sort of intellectual archaeology yeah. see if in the founders' political and constitutional thinking. If we can understand them, and you know, maybe I can get things wrong, I try to explain things as best I can. If once we can understand them, uh, then we can have the argument, well, do they make sense for us and for our times? Were they right? Um, and how, how might that discussion go, though? Were they right? How, how does that go? What's the... Really, you, 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 the chapter three is here, the most important chapter. And um, the question is, right, do we really have a um, natural right to religious liberty? Yeah. Uh, if we do have that right, what is it grounded on? Um, and is it really inalienable? Um, and if we say that it is, then the jurisprudential results that I suggest follow would follow as a matter of justice. At least a just constitution would not allow government to do certain certain things. Let's say I'm an atheist, and I say, "You're I, I'm." Let's say my reading of your book. You could tell me if I'm wrong about this. Is that the natural rights approach really depends on there being a higher duty that we're we have an uh, obligation to a creator which you've mentioned before and would that mean that this approach is in some way contingent on a, a result in philosophy of religion which is theism the argument that there is a god yeah, well, what madison, do you think about that madison's argument certainly uh it's a natural theology, right? If we have, if we owe obligations to the creator, they must be discharged in this certain way, which is according to conviction and conscience. Uh, so Madison, um, at least his argument, um, postulates that there is a creator. If there is such a creator, then our worship must be conducted in a certain way. But it certainly protects the atheist because the free exercise of religion also means uh, those who don't have a religion can't be persecuted for their atheism right so so atheism is on par in a way with christianity in the sense that it's a belief i'm going to use the phrase on par that's a mis misframing of it we don't give government authority over our religious opinions that means those who um whose religious opinion is there is no God, okay. right? Government has no authority over that as well, right? The same authority that limits, the, the same reasoning that limits government's authority to uh, uh, prescribe or proscribe uh, religious worship, uh, those limitations protect atheists as well as theists. The atheist, the, the, the Catholic is not punished for failing to go to a Protestant church, but the atheist is not punished for failing to go to a Protestant church. So I think there, um, my atheistic readers and friends, I think would find much, uh, uh, very much be included in the arguments. I think it's footnote 11 of Tor Torcaso versus Watkins, 1961, that uh, suggests what a religion, a definition of religion might be. You mentioned this in the book that the definition of religion is is difficult that has to be you know you have to provide a definition i think in that footnote uh secular humanism is mentioned as a religion uh of course secular humanism is atheistic i don't remember the footnote but it but it could be uh, yeah yeah I mean, there, I mean i i don't want to make too much of a footnote but footnotes are kind of important in these decisions well um, they're very much important to me which is why i uh yeah yeah I love footnotes. I read them carefully. 
Yeah, Chicago allowed me to uh, have footnotes at the bottom of the page and not endnotes. So, uh, oh, yes. Oh, oh God bless them. Yeah. I, I try to leave my scholarly arguments to the footnotes. Um, you know, I think most people aren't interested in scholarly arguments because uh, most scholars aren't very interesting. So well, that's fine. Uh, but if you are, you can read the footnotes. And, I, and Chicago made that very easy to do. Yeah. Uh, Phil, can we close by asking you just how you, you, you do, do such careful work here? What is it about this material that is, uh, captures you personally? How did you get interested in all this? Oh, sure. a, little bit of the, a little bit of the human uh, behind yeah. the work. Now, these cases are, um, well, the cases are very interesting. Take the Smith case, which you alluded to. You know, these two guys are, um, they go and just peyote in a religious ceremony, and then they um, file for unemployment insurance, and they're denied unemployment insurance. And the question is, you know, could they be arrested? Um, and that's an interesting question. You know, could these guys be arrested for ingesting peyote for doing this religious ceremony? And when I first read about that case in the early 90s, I thought, I'm not really sure. You know, on the one hand, I don't want anyone arrested for practicing their religion. Yeah. And on the other hand, it seems, it seems wrong that um, these guys would get a pass on the law, whereas, you know, some other guy who just ingested peyote for the fun of it would be prosecuted. That seems to violate the norm of equality. You know, are we all equal under the law? And so I thought, wow, that's interesting, and I, got, I need to think through that topic. Uh, and if you think through it, what you realize is that the idea of inalienable rights and limited government, right, a government that doesn't have authority to do everything, that's right at the core of the founder's constitutional project. It's at the core of what we call liberalism, the philosophy of government that is, aims to protect liberty. The, the way we protect liberty, the first and primary way, is we limit the authority of government. Uh, well, that's, that's a deep philosophical question. How do we draw those limits? What can government not do? And uh, I found this subject uh, encompasses all those deep philosophical and legal questions. That's what got me interested in it. I didn't, I didn't know what I thought of it. You know, I didn't know how the Smith case should come down, and I wanted to think through it. It just took me 30 years to think through it. When the, when the definition of marriage was a big deal in California about, well, I, I personally think it still is a big deal, but back when it was a political issue uh, the last 20 years or so, um, I, that was the context for me reading the, the Reynolds decision. And I, I, I remember thinking, gosh, I don't really know what I think about that, uh, criminalizing bigamy, um, penalizing it in any way. So I, I kind of, I relate to that. I think that the religion clauses really are just fraught with philosophical import. Um, there's the philosophy of religion issues. What is religion, for example? How do you even define that term? How do you know what kind of religions are legitimate religions? There's also the interesting issue of incentives, because like, for example, the drug case, um, if you make an exemption, then what kind of incentive are you giving to young people to become a certain religion if that's what gives you a pass to to ingest drugs? So it's, it's all very interesting. And we thank you for your work and we thank you for coming on uh, and talking a, a little bit with us about this complex material. Real pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.